Welcome to How to Cook That. I'm Ann Reardon and today we are looking at gluten. Gluten-free diets are becoming more and more popular nowadays. So many celebrities are promoting them. So right the second we're doing gluten-free, dairy-free, which is so hard. There are plenty of gluten-free YouTube videos too with what I eat in a day, gluten-free, gluten-free, dairy-free, or gluten-free vegan, or a mixture of all of those things in there. And you guys have asked me in the comments about gluten and gluten-free diets so many times. So is it serious or is it just a fad? The current market for gluten-free foods is sitting at $4 billion a year, and that is set to increase to $6.5 billion by 2025. The crazy thing is that even though gluten-free foods are skyrocketing, the demand for wheat is also increasing, which is very interesting, and I'll explain how that works later on in the video. Firstly though, what even is gluten? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know. No one, no one knows. When, as soon as I know, sure. You guys will be the first to know, like I promise. Like it will be everywhere. Well, gluten is actually the protein part of the wheat grain. It's also found in rye and barley, and it's not really found in any other grains. So it's unique to the wheat, rye, and barley. The word gluten actually means glue, and it helps to bind together doughs and give them that stretchy feel. There are lots of gluten-free flours available on the market now. You'll be able to find them quite easily in most supermarkets. And if we have a look on the back here, you can see this one is made mainly from starches, so maize and tapioca starch, then flours, rice and maize flour, rice bran, and thickener 415. Thickener 415 is exanthem gum, and that's used very often in gluten-free flours to try and mimic the gluten effect. Now, if I was to make a bread dough out of normal flour, and then make the exact same recipe out of this gluten-free flour, you'll be able to easily see the difference. The one made from the normal flour is really stretchy. You can just pull it, it's quite elastic, and that's the gluten in it that is allowing it to stretch. By comparison, the exact same bread recipe, but with the gluten-free flour in it, just pulls apart. It's not stretchy because it doesn't have any gluten in it. It does have the exanthem gum in it, so it has a little bit of stretch to it, but it's just not the same. If you take the normal bread dough, you can actually wash it under water and wash away all the starch because the gluten is not soluble in water, it's not going to dissolve. So if you just keep washing that dough under water, after about 10 minutes, you end up with all these little bits of gluten. And if you keep washing away the starch, eventually you're left with a ball of gluten or the stretchy wheat protein. Now, if I do the same thing with the gluten-free flour and run that under running water and just keep washing it and washing it, there is no gluten in it, so you end up just washing everything away until you have just an empty sieve. Now, we can take the ball of gluten and I can now show you what gluten does. If I put that in the microwave, there's still a little bit of water in here from washing it, so that's gonna create steam, and the gluten, see how that's stretching and making bubbles? This is what it does in the bread too. As the steam comes and the yeast creates gas, the gluten stretches and creates bubbles and gives it that texture that you get in the bread, that airy, holy structure to it. Now, as strange as it looks, this ball of pure gluten is the main ingredient in a vegan meat replacer that is very popular in Asian countries, particularly in China and in Japan. There is a product brand called, I think it's Seaton or Seaton. Tell me if I've pronounced that incorrectly. I'm sure I probably have. It has all different flavors and varieties of vegan meat replacer that's made using this wheat gluten. If you want to try making your own, all you need to do is make the ball of gluten, chuck that in the blender with some beans, and some barbecue sauce, and then you can add whatever other flavoring you want, like some powdered onion, some powdered garlic, whatever you want in there. Make it into whatever shape you want it to be, then steam that for 20 minutes. Now it expands as it cooks, so it'll be bigger after that. And then once it cools, you can use it just like normal meat. 
slice it, stir fry it or crumb coat it. Now I do realize that eggs are not vegan so don't roast me. <laughs> you can use whatever vegan egg replacers you like here and then you can fry it up. It feels softer to cut through than normal meat does and it looks like chicken. The seaton has a brown color added to it obviously to make it look more meat colored. It's a little bit softer and a tiny bit watery in your mouth compared to meat, but it's actually not bad. I thought it was going to be horrible, but it's actually edible. It's actually pretty good. Now, this is why the wheat sales have continued to rise, even though gluten-free has been on the rise, because the demand for vegan meat replacers has been taking off around the world. And gluten, because it is quite uh, chewy, it gives more of that texture that meat has when compared to something like tofu or just using beans on their own it gives more of a meat texture so that has just taken off and increased the demand for wheat anyway i digress back to our bread if i have the two doughs one made with gluten-free flour and one made with normal flour the exact same recipe and then i bake those in the oven you can see that the one made with the normal flour has risen right up. Now they both have yeast in it and yeast has made bubbles of air in there, but the gluten has been able to stretch and hold the shape of those bubbles. And as it's baked, it kind of sets and then you end up with those bubbles staying all the way through the bread whereas the gluten-free flour just wasn't able to replicate that. So using the exact same recipe, you end up with a completely different end product. So you have to make quite a lot of alterations in gluten-free cooking in order to end up with a similar end product. I'll put a few tips on the How to Cook That website for different baking things and things you can do in order to change the recipe to make it a little bit better if you're making gluten-free recipes. So because of the increased demand for gluten-free food, there is so much more available now, but it is still heaps more expensive. So for example, to buy gluten-free bread cost me three times the price of buying normal bread for the same amount of bread. Wow. The other products I got were all at least double, if not one and a half times as expensive. So the bread was the most difference in price. But I thought what we'd do is do some taste testing. So I've got Dave in because you know he loves to taste things. Mm, love to taste. <laughs> the honest reviewer. Um, and I've got a little sign that says gluten-free Dave and gluten-free <laughs> Anne <laughs> so that we can taste and then put it next to the one we think is gluten-free. So I've got a few different things to taste. So let's start with the bread. Start with this one. All right. Okay. Tastes like bread. Hmm. Definitely bready. Not bad. Yeah. And then this one. I'm going to go this one as gluten free because I like that one better and I'm assuming that the gluten free one won't be as good. That one's a little fluffier. It is. It's a lot more fluffier, a bit more chewier in the texture. So we're going for this one as gluten free. Let me check if we are right. Do, 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 do. Gluten free. Gluten -free. Ding, 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 ding. One point for you, one point for me. Yes. All right. Next, I got one of your favorites. Yeah. I got some crackers. So let's taste this one first. Mm. <laughs> mm. Those ones are good. Just thinking it through. These ones obviously lacking the food coloring of the other ones, but let's give them a taste. They're actually not bad. The texture is not bad. It doesn't have anywhere near the flavor punch mm. of these ones. Mm -hmm. This one has far more flavoring added to it. But the texture of those is actually right. pretty nice. They're definitely the gluten-free ones. I'm going gluten-free as well with those ones. Let me check. Oh, not too bad. I think we can tell by looking at them. Gluten-free. One point each. Easy to tell so far. Moving on. Let's have a taste. I'm going to break this one. Wow. Oh, wow. Crunchy. Bit dry. Mmm. It's uh, definitely got a little bit... Of strength to it, that one. It tastes like it has the feeling like I've just put flour in my mouth. Mm. So it, it's that dryness with the extra. That's not quite what I was expecting. <laughs> this one? You don't have to eat <laughs> the whole biscuit. No, I feel right. I'm going for this one. Melt in your mouth. Not gluten free. Gluten free. Wait, I haven't decided yet. You can choose. <laughs> It's really hard to replicate the exact qualities of 
gluten in wheat in a recipe with no gluten. I'm Love assuming gluten. we're right, but let's check. The gluten free. Three for three so far. This is the best taste test I've done in years. <laughs> well, definitely in months. Too much debunking videos. Woohoo! Oh my Mmm. Mmm. No. That's similar to the last one. When you first bite into it, it's good, it's got the crunch, and then you get that floury yeah. aftertaste. That's like a cheap cookie. I know it's probably three times the price, <laughs> but that's like one of those cheap cookies you get and you go, nah, they've ripped off the real thing. Not so nice. Let's, we should try the real yep, thing though. Yeah, we've already decided, but just in case. Mm. These, these are called Wheat Bix, and they're a very well-known Aussie brekkie. Aussie kids are Wheat Bix kids. I like them crunchy with the milk just poured on. Do you like them crunchy or soggy? No, I quite like them soggy. All right, well, I'm going to have to eat fast so they can taste each All right. one. I'll try this one here. Yeah. This one You've looks got to a keep bit, your spoon. It looks a little bit composty, this one. Looks healthy. That one tastes like wee bits. Let me try this one. Oh, wow. That tastes like hay. If I was a cow, I'd definitely be getting into that. I think we, we both agree this is gluten free. Kids. Yeah. But let's just double check. Does that say gluten free? It does. Gluten free <laughs> Dave says this is gluten free. All of these right. There's one more to go, Dave. Woo! This is my favourite. I'm going to go this one. Mm hmm. Pretty excited right now. Got a good crunch, good flavour. Mm hmm. I like it. Try this one. <laughs> One time I was in Malaysia and mm -hmm. I got some twisties and I didn't check the flavour and it was cuttlefish flavoured twisties, which was horrendous, <laughs> but I was really hungry so I ate them. I think they're gluten free because they're a little bit cuttlefishy. They don't taste of cuttlefish. I think you're a real fan of oh, connoisseur of twisties. I'm a, I'm a connoisseur. Whereas... I should be their ambassador. Twisties, watch this video. <laughs> Do me a solid. <laughs> Whereas I I could take or leave twisties, so both of them taste perfectly fine oh, to me. But I you, can tell, yeah, you can I can them tell they've got a stronger flavour to them, a bit like the crackers did. So I'd say these are the gluten free. But I'm going to stick with my real twisties. <laughs> so as you can see, we could easily tell the difference between all of those foods. We've both got all of them right, which ones were the gluten free and which ones weren't. So taste wise and texture wise it takes a lot of work to try and replicate a recipe that has gluten in it and make it gluten free but perhaps because it doesn't taste as good maybe that's why 65 percent of americans think that gluten-free products are healthy so if it tastes bad it must be good for you that's the logic okay and 30 percent of americans are currently trying a gluten-free diet to lose weight yes because they think it's healthy eating gluten-free will help them lose weight. Hmm. As you saw before though with the bread, you can't just swap gluten-free flour for normal flour. You have to actually modify the recipe to get an end result that looks this close to the original one. So let's just have a look at a few of the products and see what difference nutritionally changing the recipe makes to the end product. If we start with the twisties, they're not good for you anyway, sorry Dave. <laughs> but a packet of normal twisties has four teaspoons of fat in it. And a packet of gluten-free twisties has six teaspoons of fat in it. Really? So it's got a lot more. And the reason for that is gluten-free products tend to taste very dry in your mouth. And a way that manufacturers overcome that dryness is they add more fat. So you'd think you'd add more moisture, but Fat actually gives that moist mouth feel. So if you think about eating a really fatty steak, it tastes a lot more moist than a totally lean steak that tends to taste quite dry. It's the fat that gives you that moistness in your mouth. Probably more important is something like bread that people might eat more regularly. The gluten-free bread is higher in fat and has less fiber and less vitamins and less minerals in it than the normal bread does. The cereal, which normally has virtually no fat in it and a good amount of fibre, when compared to the gluten-free one, it has two teaspoons of fat in every serve and only half the fibre of the normal wheat bix. 
Studies across all gluten-free foods have found that is pretty much the case. Most gluten-free foods are higher in calories, higher in fat, lower in fiber and lower in vitamins, especially B vitamins, than their non-gluten-free counterparts. And there was one study done that showed that people who are consuming a gluten-free diet, therefore, tended to have higher calories and actually gain weight than people who were not on a gluten-free diet. So should anyone be on a gluten-free diet? Well, there's one group of people who definitely have to be on a gluten-free diet, and that's people with celiac disease. Celiac disease is an autoimmune disorder where your body sees gluten as foreign. So if you eat gluten, it sends out an immune response to attack the gluten. And unfortunately, while it's doing that, it also does damage to the gut. Our gut is pretty amazing. If you take just the small intestines and spread them out into one long tube rather than all curled up, it's actually seven meters long and about three centimeters in diameter but it has the absorptive area to absorb nutrients into the body of about the size of a tennis court. Now, if you're good at maths, you would have gone, hang on a minute, that doesn't add up. If you take a cylinder that's seven meters long and three and a half centimeters in diameter, and you flatten that out, then you've got a rectangle seven meters long by the circumference of the circle, which is two pi r, which turns out to be 9.4 centimeters. Put that into meters, and then you times the length by the width and it has a surface area of only 0.658 meters squared. So how is that even possible? They're completely different numbers. One is way bigger than the other. Well, the inside of the intestine is not smooth. Instead, it's ridged like a ridged pipe. All the way along, it has these ridges and folds and that increases the surface area somewhat. But the really tricky thing that increases it amazingly is it has these little things called villi or little bits that come up about a millimeter. They're only small all over the surface of the whole small intestine, a bit like a shag carpet, or it looks a bit like this with all these different villi sticking up. Now in someone who has celiac disease, when the immune response happens and it damages the gut, it damages all those villi and they get flattened down. So now the surface area for absorbing nutrients is greatly, greatly decreased back down to that small little area. So they often tend to be malnourished because they can't absorb the nutrients that they need. So before diagnosis, people with celiac disease can often have vitamin deficiencies and be underweight. And I'm wondering if that's where the confusion has come in. Although it doesn't really make sense because once you're diagnosed and you stop eating gluten and the gut repairs, then you can start absorbing nutrients and then they tend to put on weight, which is a good thing. If they're underweight and malnourished, they need to put on some weight and absorb some good nutrients. Now you'd think the increase in the amount of gluten-free products is a dream come true for people with celiac disease. And in certain circumstances it is, but there's a downside to it. For people with celiac disease, even eating a tiny amount of gluten, so something as small as this crumb of normal bread, which I'm struggling to get on my finger. Something as small as that can cause the allergic reaction, which can damage their gut. So they have to avoid it and they have to make sure they don't have any cross-contamination. I've got a friend in Sydney who has celiac disease and she, like most people with celiac, has little uh, heat proof bags to put her bread in in the toaster so she doesn't get any of anyone else's breadcrumbs on her bread so there's no cross contamination there. I know my friend also says she has trouble now when she goes out to cafes and restaurants because there are so many people who are ordering gluten free to lose weight that chefs aren't being super careful about that cross contamination. Whereas if you go back 15 years, the only people ordering gluten free were people with celiac disease. So they took it very seriously and made sure a bit like someone with a peanut allergy, you'd make sure they don't get even a trace in there. And that's how careful people with celiac disease need to be. The other group of people who need to avoid gluten is people with gluten sensitivity. Now gluten sensitivity is not celiac disease. It is different. They don't have that immune response. They don't have all the villi disappearing. They still have normal gut absorption, but they do get some 
gastrointestinal symptoms if they eat gluten. And they can range from things like stomach cramps, diarrhea, bloating. Some people say they get foggy head as well. You wouldn't get just that though if you didn't have the gastrointestinal symptoms when eating gluten. Now this one's a bit harder to diagnose. With celiac disease, there's a blood test and then they'll do an endoscopy. So they put a camera down your throat, down your esophagus, through your stomach, into your small intestine and they'll have a look there with that camera and see the villi. They are very small, so they'll often also take a biopsy, which looks pretty brutal, but they're just taking a little sample and then they can look at that under the microscope and see if those villi are there or if they're flattened out. Now, of course, if someone hasn't eaten gluten, their gut will have repaired. So that test is only helpful if you've been eating gluten for at least the two weeks before the test. If someone tells you that you need that test, make sure you're not eating gluten-free before it. So if you think you might have celiac disease, go see your doctor and they can certainly test you for that. Now, if you think you may have gluten sensitivity, then try a gluten-free diet for a couple of weeks then try a challenge day and add gluten in. Only do that if you had two weeks symptom free. If you're still getting the symptoms, that wasn't the, the cause of them. So if you had two weeks symptom free, do a challenge day, add it back in and see if you get that response again, then you may be gluten sens sensitive and that may be the problem. The reason why I say it may be is because when they've done studies with people who say they're gluten sensitive and they do a double blind challenge, which means the person giving you the tablet doesn't know what's in it and you don't know what's in it. Half of them are placebo, half of them are actually gluten. Of the people who are given gluten, and this is people who said they're sensitive to gluten, only a third of them actually had a reaction. The rest of them didn't have a reaction at all. So that can mean, one, you could say, well, it was just a placebo effect. They eat gluten and they feel bad, but those symptoms are pretty bad symptoms. So I would say that's unlikely. It's probably more likely that they're actually reacting to something else in the wheat. So if you look at the FODMAP diet, wheat, barley, rye are all under the fructan section. So they could be having a reaction to that. They could be having a reaction to various other things in the wheat other than the gluten. And it would be good to be able to pinpoint that, but to be honest, if you are just avoiding gluten and having none of those unpleasant symptoms and it's working for you, and with a challenge you're getting them back, then you should be okay to keep going on that. Other than that, if you don't have gluten sensitivity and you don't have celiac disease, you don't need to be on a gluten-free diet. And in fact, it's not gonna be healthier for you. It may make you gain weight. I hope you've learned something new today. I'd like to say thank you to my patrons for all of your support every single month. I really appreciate it. It encourages me to keep making videos for you and it supports me to be able to buy expensive gluten-free products and ingredients and all of those sort of things. I'd also like to say thank you to all my subscribers. If you're not one of them, you can join them by clicking subscribe and then clicking on the bell and clicking all notifications so YouTube actually lets you know when I upload a new video. What difference that makes nutritionally? <laughs> nutritionally and 30% of Americans are currently, currently, Let's try that again. I have to change the recipe. Complete blah, blah, blah. It is just very unique as far as blah, blah, blah. Do you know what I'm going to do it? As you can, <coughs> something about gluten. <laughs> uh, gluten's good for your glutes. And as Germans say, gluten morgan. Last time. One more, this, we're going to nail this. If I don't get this right, we're not doing it. All right. Not doing it at all. No. Don't be the whole Canceling the whole video. Wow, wow, wow. wow. Click here to watch some debunking videos, here to watch some recipes. Make it a great week and I'll see you on Friday.